Hello again. Um, afternoon sessions are very challenging because, you know, as a presenter, you deal with your load and load in the audience. But um, I will do my best. So, Jurgen, you mentioned that there are many engineers here, and I myself see me as an engineer. <laughs> and uh, if we look at the world of digitalization, digitization, digital transformation, to set the stage, I would like to share with you some definitions from Forbes that we are all aligned, that we are talking about the same thing. So digitization, I would like to put it here as something where we get analog information and put it in ones and zeros. Do you agree? Good. Digitalization, let's name it as a thing where we optimize using digital information and digital technologies a process, a operation. So then we digitalize an existing process. Anything against that? This is why afternoon session is good. People usually agree with you. <laughs> and uh, for digital transformation, it's something that cross-cut your business, cross-cut your organization. It's about the culture. It's about the change management across the entire value chain. Actually, a combination of digitization and digitalizing your processes. At the end, I will ask you the definition for those who still remember. With that, I would like to introduce our um, participants for the panel discussion. And the first person I would like to invite here in front is Jer Moffat. Uh, Jer is managing partner at Bank of Ireland and part of the executive leadership group of the IT and change division there. Jer has extensive experience in Ireland and the UK, working in partnership with postal, retail, and banking sectors. His strong focus is on creating high-performing teams, which have received numerous awards from customers, industry bodies, and senior managers. Please welcome Jer. <laughs> My next invitee is... Um, Urs Heusler. Urs is managing director at Valantic. He has more than 15 experience in the internet and development of startups. Urs is also the co-founder and CEO of Swiss Finance Startup, the association of all Swiss fintech startups. He is in the board of Digital Switzerland and co-founder and president of the Swiss Startup Association. Welcome, Urs. The next participant is Jörg Dietmann. Uh, Jörg, board member of Algar Enterprise Services since 2017, responsible for SAP projects of the large enterprise market and key accounts. He has previously been the CEO of Cyber AG and general manager of Cyber International, and he holds leadership positions in PeopleSoft and First Telecom. Welcome, Jörg. Our next participant is Corina Herman. Corina is managing director and co-founder of Code Supply IT Consulting, developing individual software for the clients with an everything from a single source approach. Prior to this, Corina led the software development departments at BizNode and then since 2015 worked independently as a freelancer for the clients in the publishing area, public administration and automotive. Welcome, Corina. <laughs> Tibor Molnar, TB, um, solution architect at iQuest with experience in different industries, manufacturing, banking, pharmaceuticals. Some solution times he contributed to is device integration, manufacturing, enterprise applications, and unified communication solution. Current areas of interest is product quality assurance in manufacturing with digital tools and collaboration solutions like Office 365. Hello, TV. 
And our last participant, last but not least, Jürgen Zamel. Jürgen, CEO at IQUEST since 2015. And prior to joining IQUEST, Jürgen has held senior executive management positions, including CEO of SICAP, daughter company of Swisscom, Senior Vice President at Siemens IT Services, CEO and Vice President of Consulting at Oracle Deutschland, and CEO at Sony Germany. Hello, Jürgen. <laughs> so now, being all on the same page, I would like to ask first question, Jürgen, actually to you, to address it to you. Um, I saw that in your presentation you mentioned technology. You said that we all talk about technology within the context of digital transformation. But then you also brought on the table the human technologies and leadership. So my question to you is why did you bring it on the table? What led you to that need to emphasize the human side of the digital transformation? Yeah, thanks for the question. <coughs> So as you have mentioned, I have uh, seen quite a bit of organizations, uh, including Oracle, Siemens, and so on. And actually, the 35, 35 years, mostly it was about transformations, what I did. So and doing transformations, then I, I saw that most of the transformations don't happen because of people. So yeah, because of people. So and then I thought about, yeah, but why is that? I mean, we study so good technologies. Why don't we study enough about ourselves? So and then a journey started uh, to think about, OK, why do I react right this right now? Why am I angry now, for example? So and then you consider these are programs which you have absorbed over time here inside yourself. and where you just react. You are, as you like, a robot, right? So, but if you can use them actively and say, okay, I really, I do want to have the emotion I want to have. <laughs> I do think what I want to think. If, is, is that possible? And uh, after so many years, I believe it is possible. Am I already mastering it all? <laughs> I wouldn't say so, <laughs> yes. But, but I see that it's possible. And then, if we are now moving in that direction and combining it with technology, that makes transformation work. Because there are so many conflicts in an organization which transforms. So that you, that you have to see the people and what's going on and doing it with an engineering method is, uh, is my way of advising. Thank you. I have similar question to the rest of the panelists. Uh, Jürgen, we saw your suggestion of what does it mean, digital leadership. What about the others? What does it mean for you to lead digitally? And I change a bit the meaning on purpose. OK. <clears throat> Well, I, I think uh, digital leadership, I mean, the whole digital transformation is about change, right? Um, at the end of the day, is the question is how fast can you change as a leader and how fast can you change your organization because that is actually what you know, makes the gap e e either bigger or smaller. Um, so if you, uh, as a leader, are not prepared to, to, you know, to do change or to accept change and to adopt change, then the organization most likely will not change as well. So I think digital leadership starts with yourself and um, also for the digital transformation, for me it's more a top-down approach than it's a bottom-up approach because you, know, you cannot expect from your staff that they will change by themselves and, and then take the organization to a, a change. So you have to change first and, and, and lift change and then you can expect um, your staff to actually um, join you in. Thank you, Jörg. Well, I think it's, it's a lot about courage, to be courageous. Um, what I see and what is the difference, um, me coming from the startup world as well, is um, a lot of corporates have managers that are not courageous enough. So they probably want to change and do transformation, but there's no willingness to do it. So 
I think you have to be open-minded, you have to be courageous enough, you have to um, accept that you can fail. And uh, what we lack a lot here is also cultural failure, to, to share failures, to do failures, and to be open to cannibalize yourself as well within an existing business model. Because otherwise you will be cannibalized outside, and that's much more bad than being, or cannibalize yourself inside. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I couldn't agree with uh, you more. Um, and what I've learned as well is um, that uh, you should also accept that there are people outside who know it better than you, and that you are able to learn from them and grow with them together. And I have uh, worked for many companies who have seen during the change that external stuff is bad stuff, that is the enemy, and that they are strictly believe in their own experience and they it's preventing from growth and change and that, that's a huge issue we currently have. I, w um, I would just add in a couple of points to support the points. I mean, I look at digital leadership as empowering both your colleagues and your customers um, to achieve their full potential, what they're aiming to do. And what it really needs is a lot of bravery because you've got to both, you know, you've got to have the vision and then you've got to take risks. And a lot of us operate in highly regulated industries, um, which naturally can lead people away from taking risks. Uh, because if you start empowering your colleagues, you're giving them responsibility to do things that they may get wrong. So it's really been brave. Thank you, Chair. TV from a solution. Yeah, I, w I, will, uh, I will reference many times to manufacturing because there I have more experience. And uh, there's a little bit of a different story there because there are a lot of standards and regulations, especially in the past one, two years. You know, the Volkswagen uh, thing which happened. I'm talking mostly about, more, more, most about uh, automotive. So, and there are some practical things there which uh, a leader should uh, have, should be aware of the market because there are some pressure on the market, should understand the lingo, the, ins the, the, the value chain lingo in from inside the company, should be able to talk to people from inside the company on their language, should be able to instill change because people have this uh, inherent aversion against uh, change, of course, should be able to understand technology because uh, he, the technology will help him to get to where he needs to go. So all, all these things, so some of the things are forced by the, by the market. So there are some practical skills which are needed here. So, uh, you wanna, yeah, you can go first. <laughs> okay. As, uh, so I want to explore a bit on, on change here again, um, because uh, that was mentioned very frequently also. So, and um, you know, for me, it is a bit a sort of what I call a management paradox. The paradox is the following. On the one hand, I mean, there is this economical view, right? So why do you do a transformation? And the economical view comes with something where you say, okay, I have to have to have a, some something like a nonlinear optimization, right? So I have revenue to divided by cost or quality by something, but is a ratio. Huh? So I have to optimize the ratio. So, so that is one thing. That is the economical part. But the other part is that you have to lead an organization which is under pressure, right? So and that is a human part. So now, what is a paradox now? The paradox is the following. On the one hand, you need the ingredients to solve a nonlinear equation, right? So in the ingredients, there, there is not, a real, not an algorithm for that. There is only ingredients. And there are four ingredients from my perspective. One ingredient is innovation. Yeah? So creativity, <laughs> competence, and collaboration. So now look at these four ingredients and look in an organization which is under pressure. What happens? So in an organization which is under pressure, say, okay, I have to do it the same way I have done it. I cannot now be creative, right? Yes, so, so is it about innovation? No, I do it the same way. It is the same, same way. Uh, it is collaboration. I, I, have, I have anxieties about my job, right? So, so if I have anxieties about my job, how can I collaborate, right? So, 
and, and even there might be the mindset, okay, I cannot do anything anyhow, so it just happens to me, instead of the ingredient I want to will and shape. So, so what happens, you have a paradox here. Yeah? So on the one hand, you have this economical part, which, which asked for that. On the other hand, you have this human part, yeah, so where, 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 you are count, uh, where you are contradicting, actually, what you have to have. And, the solve, uh, and solving this, <laughs> this paradox, I think that is a challenge for, for a leader in, the, in this uh, environment as well. Urs? Yeah. I want to step in here and say uh, one thing we didn't talk about it is I, I think you should switch from an inside-out view to an outside-in view. So optimizing and uh, doing better digital processes from an internal view is, is the wrong way to transform. So the most companies that have been disruptive, um, they actually came more from a customer view and they totally switched uh, in many ways the business model. So you have to have more an outside view and see really what do I need to change to deliver a better service to the, to the client and not what, like many banks do, in my opinion, very wrongly, they just optimize their internal processes and make their clients entering data themselves so they are more profitable and things like that, instead of fully changing the process that technology allows to put the customer in the center and the processes within the company just as an add-on which the customer doesn't see at all at the end, because that's what technology allows at the end, that the process is not visible anymore, but the service is in the front. I'd like actually to build up on this and uh, make an extreme statement. So what I hear from you is courage to change. But at the end, isn't this the core responsibility of the leaders? And then if we look at Forbes or Gartner view on that, they report in 2018 that 85% of top managers say if they do not make a digital transformation in two years, their business is dead. So there is a huge sense of emergency. At the same time, 7% of companies report success of whatsoever actions on digital transformation. So my question to you is, what's missing? How do you explain this? discrepancy like Jürgen presented as well and after that I would like also to have some answers from the public who takes this one who is courageous to take this one? Um, I, I think one of the tricky parts just the reality that uh, companies face into is if you take the last couple of years in the banking industry that we're going through we're very heavily regulated with low levels of trust uh, with our customers in lots of different areas of regulators and we've major programs like GDPR, PSD2, all these items that take up all the budgets. Um, so it's getting that balance, and there's a very, very strong focus on risk, on eliminating risks. And unfortunately, if one of the strengths of banks that's been around a long time, we've, by being around a long time, we've got very poor legacy systems uh, that consume a lot of time and effort to maintain. So that's the challenge of getting the time Time to change, um, having the space for it, having the funding, and being able to implement it while still getting legacy systems. It probably gets back to collaboration. Collaborating with fintechs is a great idea for us. They've got the time to innovate. We've got the customers. We've got the capital. Um, and you know, some, there, there are some of the secrets that uh, will work in, in the future. Um, but it's a complicated, it's a complicated uh, role and I suppose more people have got fired in senior positions mm -hmm. in financial service because of risk rather than because of digitization. That's just an unfortunate reality of life. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you, Jer. Uh, from my point of view, there are two different reasons why it's so hard to um, do that change. The first one is um, from the organizational point of view. Um, just because you are saying we need to change as a manager doesn't mean that the people see, see it that way. And they are also afraid to make errors, to lose their jobs. This is an issue which I um, have on a daily basis, And you can explain them again and again and try to make the change as smooth as possible. They have seen colleagues leave the company during the last 10 years due to such of 
um, failures and, and things like that. And the second part is that gap between with the technical stuff because there's so much always the new buzz around the way and what is the way we should follow now, which is the right technology which helps you to survive for the next years because you can easily pick the wrong one and then you are doomed in five years again. So um, from, from that point of view, if you are searching for the right way to at least survive for the next, I don't know, 10 years or so, it's nearly impossible. And that makes it also really hard to take the risk to start now. Mm -hmm. Very good view. Um, I, I think an additional point is we talk a lot about uh, gender diversity. Um, I think it, that's not enough. We also need age and skill diversity in the top management and in the boards. So which comes back uh, again to, to uh, bravery, that you have to be more brave um, to let some younger people um, with other skills in the boards and in the top management to ask the right questions. Like uh, kings used to have in the medieval times, like the Hofnar, the, the guy who was able to ask all stupid questions to the king without being beheaded. So I think um, top management should have more of those guys that, that are able to ask the, the, the really uh, stupid questions from a digital point of view and uh, to bring more of those questions and, and, and change requests. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I uh, fully agree, by the way. Um, but I, I just want to underline what you just said, uh, Guillaume. Um, if, if you look at companies, they spend about 80 to 90% of their IT budget in maintaining their existing systems. So in innovation, it leads up to between, well, 10, probably 20% is a good number for, for companies. So if you think about a major change like the digital transformation, and it just actually came from the SAP user group in Germany, and um, the SAP user group asked the question to their users and say, how far are you in the digital pro uh, transformation process with SAP? And actually nobody really turned up and said, you know, we are very far, uh, because if you look at the prerequisite to, uh, from a technology point of view, it's not there. It's simply not there. You know, the, the companies has to do some of the homeworks um, before they can actually enter from a technology point of view in a digital process. Um, besides the fact that, you know, management is, is important and people is, uh, are important. And, you know, I think this is a, a big thing we have to actually overcome. Mm -hmm. TV? So I would like to give you two examples, one good example and one not so good example. The first one is for banking. I specifically called the guy who is charged with digital transformation. He has a 40-member team. And in this case, indeed, the CEO is pushing heavily. He, uh, the CEO understands technology, understands trends on the industry, and is very agile, very fast. And uh, uh, as you said before, one of the objective of the digital transformation team is to be close to the customer. It's clear, this is, this is their goal, and this is what they are doing. So they are, and this, this leads to business model changes, because they, being close to the customer, you have to change how to deal with the customer, to have to change the communication channels, you have to introduce new technologies, and so on. This is a good example. Uh, answering to your question from manufacturing, why, why we have this gap between uh, the potential and the real situation. One thing what I saw is business priorities. Business priorities means that do not leave a change for, for innovation, lack of resources. We have to, we have to optimize our current business because we have, do not have enough resources. And the third thing what I saw is lack of vision. So what's happening, I'm talking about global companies having a central IT in Germany. What's happening is that Directions are not clear. There are local champions fighting against central IT. Uh, central IT demand management process takes six months. So bureaucracy, so no vision, no uh, clear steps on how to change things. So this, this is the thing what I observe. Now I can also add uh, one point, uh, because you also mentioned risk. Uh, so, and uh, I, I think this risk topic is a broader topic as well, because you also mentioned courage. Yeah? So. so and the, the question is, are we really good enough balanced as persons to see equally the risks and the opportunities? So, so 
And if we are more on the risk side, yeah, so then again would come back to human technologies. That means we are more driven by anxieties, right? So if you are more driven by anxieties, the question is what of those anxieties are real or which are homemade? Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So now if you are able to get rid of the anxieties which are homemade, automatically we will come to a situation where you see more balanced opportunities and the risks. And that specifically in an organization which is under pressure is I think something which we have, which we have to consider. <clears throat> there's, by the way, there is a nice saying in Germany, das Pferd springt so hoch wie es muss, um, <laughs> which means the horse only jumps as high as it must uh, do. I think, you know, from a tra digital transformation perspective, most of the companies, they do just what they have to do in, you know, as a minimum. Thank you. I have a question to the audience. If um, somebody is courageous, brave enough to give us examples from their companies of a digitally transformed organization, maybe good or maybe bad examples. Do you have digital transformation programs in your organization? Obvious question. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say that we have got a um, digital trans um, transformation program going on, uh, but um, the one challenge is that uh, it's about the people in the company, not just the top management, but the people in the company believing in this um, journey. And then the second one is, is trying to do too much um, at the same time. So uh, not just work on one, um, one area uh, credit reports and say we're going to transform that um, into a more digitalized offering to customers, but then working on something else and something else and something else. So in the end, we got seven initiatives going on. And, uh, and then it comes to something someone said about resourcing being the challenge, because suddenly you've got too many people working on diverse things. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other one is, is that the people that want to push it forward are also held back, because there are those um, people that aren't courageous enough to believe in um, the journey. So uh, that's what we're experiencing at the moment. Um, the program, we've got the investment, we've got the financing, uh, support from the board, owners, etc., but uh, sometimes we stall because of those factors. Resistance. Resistance as well as um, ambitious, too ambitious. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from the public, if not opinions? Um, Andre, you mentioned uh, the discrepancy between the need for digital transformation and success for uh, digital awareness, the sense of yeah. emergency, Awa and exactly results. Exactly. exactly. And you mentioned something like seven percent success of transformation. So um, I'm wondering how the tr digital transformation was designed or was um, pr uh, prepared to be done in the organization, because I agree it could it should start from the client perspective for sure. On the other hand, uh, I think all, uh, all the people mentioned that it's about people transformation as well, and you have the resistance to change. So uh, I would uh, put maybe as a rhetorical question, was any vision regarding the people, um, how the organization will look like after digital transformation from the people perspective? Because in this case, you can actually get some attraction from the people, maybe um, address some anxieties, and get also some of the buy-in for the people and then diminish the resistance. So not only create the need for a change, but also create the opportunity for a change for the people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, we have many examples of new businesses where digital transformation is just amazing. Uber. It's a transportation company without any 
car, you know, uh, Airbnb. It's a huge hotel without any rooms, ownership there. But do we have examples of the old businesses, old companies that managed successfully the digital transformation in a way of changing completely their business model? Well, I think, um, for example, some media houses did quite well. So um, they had a, an advertisement business, they were printing on paper, and people were purchasing paper. And, and this basically is more or less gone. So they had to, um, in the last five to ten years, they had to transform their whole um, revenue stream um, to more than 70, 80 percent digital revenue stream. So I think this is a this is a positive uh, um, example for digital for for a successful digital transformation for some of the companies that still exist. Um, what I can also add is I'm pretty sure that's not finished yet, but I'm really impressed with the progress Daimler made. Um, they um, recognized that they are not experienced with the e-commerce stuff, and they partnered up with a, a specialized e-commerce company in Stuttgart and. Uh, they uh, first tried out to build a completely new um, customer-centered, customer journey-centered shop uh, with, a, with a niche product. So that means buying caps and shirts and so on. And then they tried out how it should work and standardized everything. And now they have included like park pilot stuff, the whole Connect series. And this is something which really impressed me. And it worked so well that they now built a combined company um, at Mercedes-Benz I.O. and um, they uh, have that full approach and it uh, also led to a completely different organizational structure. They are trying holocracy, for example. I'm, I, we will see how that works out in the end. Um, I know there are also some really tough challenges, challenges inside, but uh, that really impresses me and I'm really curious how this will proceed during the next years. Thank you. I would like to emphasize something regarding the term digital transformation. I think digital transformation started 50 years ago. It's not something which uh, happened two years ago, it started to happen two years ago. The difference is that the, the processing power and the technologies are, uh, are uh, progressing faster now. But uh, think about uh, the first scan, scanning machine, or think about uh, mobile phones or I, I would like to give two examples one example ATM machines for him for me ATM machine was a big business model change and also online banking online banking again was and everybody had to do it these are good examples so digital transformation is not a hype it's something which which started and I think will never end so with companies who are able to do digital transformation they are doing constant transformation they will never stop I, I disagree a little bit because the speed extremely increased and, and, and that's the main difference, you know. When you look at the, at the uh, um, Forbes 500 uh, list, um, in 1955 an average duration of a company was 75 years. In the last 15 years, 50% 50 of those companies, which are the largest companies in the whole world, disappear from the list and the average time now is 10 years. And when we look at some of the companies like Facebook and uh, Google and so on, um, they're 10 years old. So the speed really increases, which puts much more pressure um, on fast transformation than you had 50 years ago. Um, I was just going to use an example of um, a company who probably have changed the marketplace, which would be Ryanair, it's an example of the travel world. I mean, Ryanair existed as they weren't a new entrant. They were a traditional company operating a very competitive route, Irish company, mainly between Ireland and the UK. And they came along and they got rid of, they said, we're not going to deal with travel agents. Remember back, we all used to, lots of us, those who were old enough, would deal with them. They went direct, they created a model, others have copied it. But, you know, now possibly the biggest uh, operator in the world. Uh, yesterday, they got a very big boost uh, from one of their top investors who have increased their, uh, their shareholding in them. And, you know, we're just pushing out the boundaries in terms of their business, all to using a digital model. 
that they're able to apply in the, you know, a traditional industry, but they're an industry that's existed for some significant period of time. So they'd be a very successful example. If I could use a parochial one, uh, with a lot of colleagues here, including Tibby being involved, we're very proud in the Bank of Ireland of a digital project that we did with iQuest. And we had a, a German CEO for a couple of years, CIO, who described it as probably the best digital project he'd seen in his career. Um, Tibby, you might give some examples of how you think it worked. And, uh, but um, it was basically based on, obviously, iQuest built super technology for us. The key thing we did, maybe rather than customer experience, was user experience. So sure, it was a key thing on building a mortgage system, a mortgage origination system, which is one of the biggest decisions for people is to get a mortgage, very personal, big decision. And we worked, put a huge amount of time into the UX design, which meant the customer was critical. What did the customer want? But it wasn't just the customer. We spoke to brokers that we dealt with, people in our branches, people who were underwriting the loans, processing the loans, the admin people who were making the payments, etc. And for every one of them, we worked through what was the biggest pain point or biggest concern. And so where their satisfaction dipped, we attacked that and found ways in which we could make that a better experience. And a for example is for a customer, when you go applying for a loan, um, uh, it's always a very personal thing, particularly for your house. And you've got this, what's going to happen? I've sent in my forms and somebody is deciding out there and I've lost control. So we focused on that and let the customer know, first of all, they could tell at all times, had they completed all the inputs, where it was at, how many stages to the process it was. And you know, we launched it, and since then it's been multi-award winning. We've won awards that actually we didn't apply for ourselves. They've been nominated by brokers. And just a huge example of a combination of where you can get the user design right. We then have the champions, are championing it for us are the brokers. The customers who use it, our brand staff love it, our mortgage staff love it. And that was true, the investment was in design. We got the design right. We then had to make sure and collaborate with iQuest that the software uh, delivered on it. And it just becomes a self-fulfilling uh, success story after it. Next week, we're about to launch it with the UK market, we're going to launch it in the mm -hmm. Irish market, and our Irish brokers are saying to us, you're going to blow this market apart. Well. Uh, so it's a, you know, a good example where we took a niche area within the bank and applied it rather than trying to do something, uh, something globally. So let me, let me add to what TB said, also what Urs said, and also what, what you said. So maybe a, a good example for who is doing the uh, digital transformation in a good way is uh, Bank of Ireland, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, so for me it is a, it's a good example what I'm seeing actually, right? right. So to, to what, uh, what, what TB mentioned and also what Urs mentioned is I believe we are, and it is not my example, I have read it in the book but I was intrigued by it. So we are on the, on the second part of the chess field. Yeah? As it's, you know, the inventor of chess was asked by his, his king, he said, okay, what do you want to have for that? Right, and then they said, "Okay, just give one rice corn on the first field, yeah. So and then double it from field to field." Okay, so said the king, "That's fine." Uh, but uh, <laughs> you end up by having, at the end of the day, seven years of harvest, right? <laughs> World harvest. Now, what I'm saying by that is that on the second half of the chess field, the imagination stops. We can think linear, and this is why I believe, you know, I agree that digitalization started 50 years ago, but now, in the 50th year, we are in the second part of the chess field, which is 64, and then the imagination stops somehow. Eh? And that is what, uh, what we have to consider. So another good example, by the way, what I was uh, thinking was doing quite well in digitalization is uh, uh, a manufacturer in Switzerland, actually Pilatus. Is, uh, is, is doing quite well, so by inventing now the first uh, jet, which is being uh, launched, I believe, uh, this year even. So, and I, I think if you look at the cockpit and, and, and so on, then you see what also digitization means there. <laughs> so, that is, would be my example. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Um, 
I'm referring to uh, what you said about you have started this digital transformation process, but somehow you get overwhelmed with uh, may maybe too many streams already started. And I also refer to the fact that at this moment we actually have oh, pretty much 90% of the data created in the past year, 90% uh, of the data existent out there, it's created last year and we're processing just 1% out of that. And then I come back to what you said, Urs, that client centricity is uh, at most critical in, in digital transformation. And so my question is, how do you prioritize? With what do you start when you start a digital transformation process? Because there are definitely many streams that you can go on, but how do you prioritize? Any of uh, the panelists? <laughs> um, I think that's what we pay uh, very expensive CEOs for uh, and boards. <laughs> um, you really have to a good way of understanding, prioritizing, looking at your business and saying, am I dealing with an opportunity or a threat? Uh, what, are the, what are the big opportunities that are there for us? Is there a new market opportunity, new market sector? Can we do something different? Can we innovate? Um, and so if that's, if that's your main item area, you, you know, that's really where you should, you should focus on. If you've got something where you've got a severe cost problem or you're losing market share, that becomes the driver. Uh, but I do like your main point, which is it should be data driven. So the big test is how many decisions are made based on emotion and the opinions of the CEO as distinct from being ones that are based on facts and data and that are informed as you proceed by mm -hmm. facts and, and, and data. Yes, because uh, there was talk about courage and bravery. <laughs> um, it might be just uh, kamikaze if there's no data there. So sure. probably, yeah, start with that. So Urs? Yeah, I would like to add that it's always a question of how the setting is. You know, if you do more the waterfall, um, approach where you where where you go back to your cellar and you start one uh, and, and, and another initiative and then it takes a lot of money um, or if you manage to become a more agile company where you launch test balloons and uh, you go with the premise that you launch fast try out fast fail fast and iterate and um, so I think those companies that have been very successful in digital transformation are those that are really um, launching fast and they also have the courage to stop something when it doesn't get traction and doesn't get positive feedback from the market and, 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 and their customers. So you should not always invest a lot of money in initiatives, but you should start many initiatives um, in smaller agile teams that probably are even outside of the normal company that have more freedom, um, less paperwork and bureaucracy. Um, that you can really test it and then most important you need to also to have a process that successful small test balloons can be brought back into the core system of the company which um, I believe and maybe you agree especially in banking a lot of banks fail they do a lot of good testing but then when they need to integrate in a very high regulated uh, core system then there are, is no processes to do so, to do it successfully, and maybe that's also a reason why we only have 7% success rate. Uh, I would like to add uh, one additional thing to stopping things. It's um, even to go a step further, just try it out, um, recognize if a product is already dead, and um, don't be afraid to make maybe a handful of customers unhappy, but just stop doing it. You don't need to uh, transformize, transform, transform everything uh, which is there. Just stop doing things. And um, there are a lot of uh, people, managers, who are afraid to do so and who are still burning data on DVDs, for example. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's a great question, by the way. And I think it different. It, it, it's very different from vertical to vertical. Um, I. You know, I like the example of retail actually because retail is a very interesting vertical. Um, I think the traditional retailers are in trouble to some extent because Amazon, Alibaba, and others, um, uh, they actually the traditional retailers gave room for an Amazon. And 
it's very seldom that um, I saw a retail company, a traditional retail company, asking the customer the question what they would like to see first as a change. You know, the first thing I would like is that I don't stand in front of a POS and, and wait until you know, I'm there or, or I can do something. And, um, and this is you know, the, the, the question I think we should ask our customer and say, what would you like to change first? And, and then take small steps uh, instead of doing a big project. I think time for big projects is over. You know, and um, let me refer one more to SAP, but the time is over to implement SAP in five years. Because you know the process you defined five years ago is not the same like you you know you have uh, available when you when you uh, go live, so you have to do small changes and and part of this is actually to move some of the, your systems in the cloud, because you can be more flexible, you can be more agile if you have you know if you don't take all the environment with you, but then it comes back at least in Germany you know do you trust in the cloud? I don't know. I mean, many, you know, we asked the same question to the SAP user group. They said, well, we can, marketing can be in the cloud. But our core process, no, no, they can't be in the cloud. It's too dangerous. But that's the, the reality. So how do you want to be flexible, agile? If you always have to have your, the, the, the big machines around you, it's, it's very difficult. So. Um. The problem is um, if you have customers who are very conservative as well and you ask them what should I change first, they always tell you don't change anything. And I experienced this actually with a client of mine. Um, the customers, they won't change anything. So you have not only the change management within your company, you also need to guide the customer through the change. And that is a really, really tough thing to do, especially for smaller companies. Then you might should ask the ones that are not customers yet what you should change that they become a customer. Uh, the problem is that the market generally is really conservative and um, so you, uh, you need to wait for younger people who are growing into the market and for example some companies don't have 20 years to wait until the next generation becomes a customer and that is a really tough challenge because it's now. And, um, yeah. this, is, and this is part of the, the challenge in the digital transformation. I mean, it, you have, you've got customer, I mean, you need to listen to your customer, you need to listen to your employees, you would be a good leader to start it, you have to have the right technology, and, and this is the thing, you know, there, is, there are lots of things at the same time, unfortunately, but that's what it is. And, um, and you know, we, I think it's better to start, and I like your last fifth ingredient, um, start with something in order to make you know, make it a new experience. I mean, there is a grocery store, for example, in, in Germany. They started to um, to give handhelds to 33,000 employees of, of the grocery store. So in each store, if you go there and you ask for a, for a product or, you know, what, what's the ingredient in a the product, they can answer it immediately out of the backend system and, uh, and have a mobile phone. If you ask another retailer and say, you know, what do you think about it? And they say, oh, 33,000 handles, are you crazy? I mean, our margin is so low, but you know, the margin may go away completely. And I think we need to give customer a, a, a better customer experience. I mean, that's... Yeah, the company did it, they changed it, but it was a really tough, tough way to go through it. priorities. What about technology? Is it still <laughs> important <laughs> in the digital transformation? And how is it important? What are the technology trends that maybe can help us to overcome this resistance or regulatory constraints? Okay, I, I can take uh, <laughs> and you will be disappointed with about what I will say now. <laughs> so uh, the thing is that uh, we are reading about uh, you know, marketing materials from the big companies starting with machine learning, uh, augmented reality, blockchain and so on. But when uh, I personally go in the fields, I see a different story. So uh, I'm talking about pharma companies who are pushing papers from the one desk to another. Ten years ago I saw the same, same thing. 
uh, I go to uh, factories where uh, incidents are, are managed using printed papers. Reports are written on printed papers and then brought to the, to the central place where they are, are hide physically. So my point is that there's a big uh, difference, at least from my experience, my experience about the expectations set by marketing and about what is needed uh, on the fields to make the first steps. And uh, maybe a workflow automation would be nice first. Maybe a document management system would be nice. Things which were existed 15 years ago. So uh, about technology, a uh, majority of the companies that I, I, I visited, so-called, especially in manufacturing, so-called long fuse big bang, meaning that long fuse anti-digitization starts, big bang, big business model changes. They need right now basic, uh, basic systems which would help to automate basic tasks. We cannot talk about things like machine learning or data science or stuff like this. Is this my experience? The problem is that uh, the customer is still wanting to have all the buzzwords done. So, um, <laughs> in my, uh, from my point of view, you need to find a way to combine it in a way that it doesn't hurt. So, um, establish these basic things you are talking about and then finding a way to also make some kind of small proof of concepts what for example machine learning would would be an appropriate uh, way to include it or is it not uh, at all interesting for your specific company so um, yeah uh, my view is uh, is the following so that so, so you mentioned also the my my do now right so so as a fifth ingredient and you asked also for priorities so so for me it's first of all to go in a circle through these four quadrants which i have shown yes so, so that is an iterative approach and that from my perspective also leads to the situation that you use a piece of a technology to go more into a business process right so and i do think that that the penetration of business processes through technology will increase dramatically. And that to master in that way, and that by, by that also new technology will come, by the way, I, I believe. So I, I think getting technology into the business processes and see what kind of, of innovation is coming out of that, that is what I would see iteratively coming. Jer? I would just say from a retail perspective, we probably need to look, I suppose, <clears throat> for anybody who's got children, you know, have they a bigger loyalty to their Apple phone than to their parents? Uh, and just how much do the personal handheld devices have become so important to everybody? Um, how many of us, you know, get your directions every day? But go to all the things that we do. So the question is going to be the challenge for how we interact and how the personal devices that in, all of us have our new customers will have, our existing customers, what computing power they will have, how they want to use it, and how we'll maintain loyalty with our customers that will have that same, that will be relevant to when they decide uh, how they use that, that, that personal computing power. Um, I think the other piece that probably balances is probably the whole challenge of with balancing big data and what bro Big Brother knows about you with ethics, privacy, and people's desire then for, uh, for privacy. And if I could just use a personal example I'm grappling with at the moment is, you know, we go to so many presentations, how fantastic Amazon is. They're absolutely fantastic, amazing growth story, amazing data, and what they know about you. Uh, but probably lacking some ways the kind of sense of humor. My personal one that I'm grappling with is this time last year, I was invited in Ireland to a fancy dress party. So um, I decided on Amazon, I got this great suit for 35, Euros, which was a Brexit suit, uh, which was very topical. Union Jack suit, top and bottom, right? Tie, lovely stuff, lovely badges, right? So went as a mad Brexiteer. Um, since then, every time I log on to Amazon, they're offering me Union Jacks, uh, they're offering me Brexit posters, postcards of calendars of all kinds of folks. And no matter what I do, uh, no matter what I delete, um, I can't get rid of 
uh, then not realizing I'm an Irishman who's pro EU, I think, thinking that I'm pro Brexit here. But you know, it's just a simple little example of where the system knows a lot about you um, and can sometimes can get it wrong, and how we will work and how we will balance that going forward. That you know, we can all see it coming the backlash against um, invasion of privacy. If we were here like two years ago, a small UK-based company in a small office near where my office is in London had a massive influence on the US elections, it used tremendous amounts of data uh, to drive everything that um, Trump was saying and influenced all the marketing. And you would have sat and thought that that's a tremendous story. That must be great for that company going forward. Two years later, they no longer exist and they're in all kinds of trouble. Uh, so that's going to be a fascinating piece to watch going forward, that balance of the big data question and how it's used and digital marketing versus privacy ethics, etc. A comment from my side, if we look at the technologies that support digital transformation, you know, IoT, blockchain, um, in the recent months, there is more and more discussion about artificial intelligence. I think earlier in our presentation today morning, we saw chatbot, and we all recognize when we call our telco provider, you don't talk to a human being anymore. It's a machine there. And there are more and more voices, especially from the human research side, saying, okay, we are all super excited about digital transformation, but what about the dark side? You know, we reach the level when you talk to a colleague who is chatting with someone while keeping an eye contact with you. So there are some skills like empathy, communication, that we reduce dramatically by introducing digital technologies. How do you think that affects the leadership of the future? How this affects our organization if we digitalize ourselves before we digitalize our clients and services? <clears throat> uh, I think it's an interesting question. I, um, I do agree and I hate actually those chat box to some extent, uh, <laughs> at least when I talk to my telco provider. Um, I think, you know, we, and, and it's a leadership issue because, I mean, at, at some point, and I, let me give you one simple example. I talked to a client about um, digitalization, uh, um, about going digital with their uh, travel management. And they said, it's very hard actually to get a, um, you know, travel management in the cloud and uh, at, at just a, great solution in place because people are afraid that they lose their jobs. And I said, well, where, wh who, who is going to lose his job? I said, well, in the administration, there are people, they control the, the travel expenses and they make sure, sure that they get paid and, and stuff and they would actually lose their job. And I said, there must be something in a world where we actually fight for talents that we have enough work and have enough more intelligent work than having people just controlling travel expenses. So I think it's a leadership issue and it's about probably digital education that we think about how we educate our, our staff in a way that we make them more meaningful to, um, to the company and, and, and then use chatbots or, or some other stuff uh, for kind of boring work. That's what I would say. Yeah, I would, uh, would like to add to that. Uh, so, I mean, I, I see the dark side of digitization, a digitalization uh, that we are not humans anymore, right? So, so that, uh, that uh, we are planting a chip in our brain in order to function like that. But from my point of view, that will not work. Uh, so, so this is why I agree very much with you, what you said. It is a lot about... Uh, education, but also having, having the education stuff there. I mean, because, so, so, so that has to be developed as well, yes? So, so how do we educate about that? So education, mentoring, coaching, that are from my point of view the things leaders have to, to learn, actually. And, uh, and we uh, have hopefully the chance to stay humans <laughs> and not be digitized. <laughs> 
Um, I, I think it's also at the end uh, a question the society has to solve and to discuss and uh, there's a lot of dialogue needed. Um, digitalization or technology um, allows a lot, for example, if you take an insurance, you could actually manage the risk down to an individual and you could price the individual risk but then no insurance is needed anymore because the bad risks won't insure them, the good risk will insure them, but it's not needed. So at the end, the society has to define, do we want to have an insurance which basically hatches some people that are unlucky and the majority of the people pay in for that. So it's a question as well at the end, if we want to have certain like products or not, even technology would allow to totally change them. So at the end, it's, uh, it's in many, many ways probably also a dialogue needed uh, in the society. Who will, will be the big winner of, of technology? Will it be, coming back to Marx, will it be only the capital who produces the robots? Or will it be the society as a whole? Which will be a very interesting dialogue, I believe. And um, we shouldn't forget that we are humans and we like to talk with humans, or well, I hope so. So that means, uh, for example, if I had that uh, computer voice on the other side of the phone call, I always say, Berater. So that means I want to talk with a decent human being. So um, what it means is uh, we decide what we digitalize and not, because as far as I know, we are not in a Terminator-like environment. So it's all in our own hands. Um, yeah. Yeah, just maybe backing up, I mean, one of the better definitions I've heard of robotics would be automating robotic tasks. So it's, you know, we really have to look at process and say, is this really robotic or not, uh, would, be, would be the question on it. And sometimes I think back, I know this might, I might look like a dinosaur in saying it, but I was talking to a guy from IBM in Ireland in the late 80s, and he said that at the start of the 80s, he was an accountant running their finance department, he said the big question was with the paperless office and automation. They were saying in the 90s, the management challenge was what couldn't you do in your spare time? You'll have so much spare time. And, and that most definitely uh, hasn't happened for any of us here in management positions that we've ended up with. It. So I would say for you know, our ingenuity, if we, ro if we automate the robotic tasks, there are a huge number of things that we can be involved in and that are much more productive for all of us. I would like to challenge that and then ask also for opinions from public because by digitalizing, we digitalize communication and I give you an example of Uber which is a completely different experience from the moment you order your car, you enter it, you exchange not a single word with the driver because he knows exactly where you go and you don't even have to agree on a price. So it's a completely silent experience comparing to some years ago when taxi drivers were, you know, source of the most important information in the region. And that disappears. Yeah, but I mean, you are at least saying hi to the driver, right? <laughs> so How many of you say hi to the I, Uber I, I, drivers? Yes, I did yesterday, <laughs> twice. Okay, it means that we are quite old in this audience. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with your example, even though I believe it's, um, it's you know, it's a, it's a bad example. <laughs> because you don't have a problem. I mean, you solve your problem, but you don't have a problem. I mean, if you call your teco, and it, then you probably have a problem because otherwise you wouldn't call him. I can tell you a problem. Colleagues in Ike was sitting one near to each other and just chatting instead of talking. Yes. That's digital transformation. I mean, these are the side effects and I agree the education is important, but, but how we can, I, I, I would not go into the society, how we can protect our companies that you know, digital stuff enables us to get forward and not being cyber sapienized. I think it's, a, it's in a way a immature use of technology at the moment and, and this will probably change 
over time. Maybe even the like the five-year-olds today will use technology in a much wiser way that we use it at the moment, and not just sit there and watch their phones anymore, like many of us do. Um, when I uh, think back of when the first uh, phones came that you could uh, afford and also to talk, in the beginning people were like showing off with their phones and, and saying like, hey, I can afford a, a mobile phone and I can even talk and pretend to talk, although they did not even make a phone call because it was too expensive. Um, <laughs> and, and, and they changed totally. The, the usage of, of, of using the phone as a phone in a way disappeared. Now you use it very wrongly in, in a different way. So I think you learn to use technology in a wiser way over time. So I'm positive on that. Okay. I would like to mention two things uh, regarding Jill, what you said is that I, I think that technology can be used to have more, more creative time and creation, creativity requires communication. So it could be beneficial. But the problem I, don't, I see is not not the digitalization from inside the company, but from the outside of the company. I'm talking about social media, uh, Snapchat, Facebook, whatever. So I'm looking at the, new, uh, the newer generation. Uh, a bigger and bigger part of the time, of the working time, is spent with Facebook and uh, other kind of things which are not really <laughs> related to the, to the work they, sh they should be done. So if, if we wouldn't use Facebook, for instance, in the company, and if we would have our tasks uh, automatized, for instance, if uh, I wouldn't have to uh, do every month uh, my, uh, you know, my time report, because it would be done automatically for me, I would have more time to do creative things, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't really see a big problem in, from inside the, the companies. I see more from the outside. Um, I totally agree with you regarding the change, how to use technologies or um, the whole digital world, because I see it also in the new generation, which is now like 16 years old or 15 years old, they don't like Facebook, they don't use Facebook, it's not as existing for them, so they search for other things to express themselves, and um, I also recently deleted my Facebook account, it's simply boring. <laughs> It had his time, it was, uh, it was a funny, funny thing to have and it uh, helped me to connect uh, with uh, people in, in one of my former companies, but that it's over. And also, I'm, I'm not sure how it's about all of you, but I get tired looking at my phone constantly um, and I want to re really interact with people and not like chatting. So um, for me, it's, I'm really glad that I don't need to look at a computer, at a smartphone or a tablet at home. I just want to have a real, real interaction. So that is my personal experience with that. I think when, when TV came out, people were thinking that TV is going to like kill education and everything and people will just watch 10 hours a day TV. And at the moment, TV is fighting that it's still being watched. Um, because you have other technology you look at and maybe in 10, 20 years we'll say, well, <laughs> Facebook or whatever social media was like 20 years ago, people were afraid of it, but it's not existent anymore. Who knows? Okay. Yeah, I think there's maybe two interesting examples of what's happening in Ireland and two pilots on dealing with people who say aren't used to change or for elderly people living on their own at home, which is a major issue both for them from a loneliness perspective, health, and for their relations or friends. And there's two interesting pilots, one human, one non-human. One is we have a major accommodation problem, very expensive accommodation. So there's a pilot running where students can stay at a very low rate and they stay with an elderly person uh, with her in, in Dublin, come to Dublin, they stay with an elderly person and they commit that they'll sit down and eat a meal with them twice a week and they come in, they come and stay. Big plus, obviously, for the elderly people and big plus for um, the individual, the young person. We're all saying they enjoy talking to the older person and they also get cheaper accommodation. But we're also trying with the same individuals, same age group, robots, that they then have a robot that's with them. And there's a very good reaction from the elderly people. They have a robot. The robot also can let their family members know that the elderly relation hasn't taken, uh, you know, hasn't got out of bed, hasn't taken their tablets. And uh, you know, it's a very, very interesting one of two different pilots, one with technology, one without, and actually the very positive reaction to the robots as well. Mm -hmm. I would like to summarize 
Um, what I heard today is responsibility to use the technology, and technology is important as a prerequisite, but most of the talk we had was about people, resistance, courage, adoption. And uh, to conclude this discussion, uh, I thank you all for participation, and I would like to ask each of you one last question. If there would be one word for you to associate with digital transformation, what that would be? Only one word? One word. Change. Crazy. <laughs> Evolution. Um, I would say empowering. Empowering? I would say adaptiveness. And I would say courage. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Please applaud our panelists for the interesting discussion. What's next? So thank you again all for joining us into this event and thank you again for our panelists who have gracefully shared their thoughts, uh, opinions and experience with us. Let's keep the human touch. So <laughs> I kindly invite you to join us at 7 o'clock at Crush Wine Bar for drinks, uh, some food, some good talks, and keep the human touch. And happy anniversary, iQuest, and happy to have you here to celebrate with us. Thank you.